Okay. Uh, so, hi, I'm Ed Morehouse. I'm going to talk to you about the categorical semantics of proof theory. Um, so, this morning Frank started telling you a bit about proof theory, and I was trying to pick a topic for uh, a basic course in category theory. I thought, okay, what's a topic that I hope the people here really know something about? And I realized, oh, I know something that they're, they're guaranteed to know something about because they'll be work on it directly before mine. So, um, basically, when Frank said that what he's going to be talking about is sort of just a little corner of uh, some of the things that Bob sketched out at the beginning of his lectures, um, I'm going to sort of do a little corner of the little corner. So, the goal of this course is basically dual. One is to introduce you to the basic concept of category theory, but that would be kind of boring if it were just a whole bunch of definitions of numbers and stuff, and stuff from like abstract algebra and topology, which you know, a lot of us probably don't know too much about. Uh, so instead, our goal is going to be eventually trying to get an algebraic characterization of this idea of harmony of the connective. So this morning there was a question from the audience, like what that could mean when, when uh, a definition of a connective could be harmonious. And this will be sort of a partial answer to that. So this is the basic outline of the, the, uh, the lecture. So today we're just going to talk about the basics of category theory. Um, next time we're going to talk about what I call behavioral reasoning. That's the way that we have to reason when we can't do sort of element-wise uh, characterizations of the objects of the study that we're talking about. Uh, the third lecture will be about universal construction. So that's how we define things in category theory. Uh, things like the product that Bob told you about earlier. We're going to see how we can do many such constructions and that they're going to be defined uh, in a behavioral fashion. The fourth day will be about the two-dimensional structure of categories. So set theory is sort of a zero-dimensional or a discrete subject, right? Sets are, are discrete. And we, we're going to see that we can use categories in such sets. So we sort of add a dimension We'll get to shortly uh, to do that. And so if we want to study categories themselves behaviorally, we're going to see that we need to sort of add another dimension. So we're going to have this two-dimensional structure that lets us talk about uh, behavior and categories themselves. <coughs> and then the fifth day, I'm going to talk about uh, dependency. And that's going to be important for um, interpreting the uh, quantifiers of the first time. So the goal uh, for all of the lectures together will be to get some background in category theory, and then eventually to understand uh, how we can understand the harmony of the connectives of first order logic from an algebraic perspective. And when I say algebraic, I mean like an equation of the order of the category. Okay. Um, so there are lecture notes. This is good for you because it means a lot less writing. Uh, I'm in Morehouse. If you search for me, there, there's another guy named Ed Morehouse who's a well-known actor. I'm not him. Uh, as far as I know, he has not written any lecture notes on categorical semantics of proof theory. So if you go to my web page and you scroll down to the section on like lecture notes, it's the first thing in the list. Uh, this is good for you because it means you can like, spend more time paying attention and thinking and asking questions. And it's good for me because it helps me organize my thoughts and make sure that I don't like, you know, do things in that order of dependency that doesn't make sense. Um, but I did spend more time sort of scribbling the notes down in a few of genius than I did editing them. So if you find some mistakes, please just let me know and I'll fix them. Um, and likewise, when I write on the board or when I speak, uh, you know, it's like a lot harder to do it from this side of the room than, than to watch it from that side. So if I say or write the wrong thing and it's obvious that you know, I, just, I just made a slip, just shout out the right thing so no one else is confused. Um, and if you have questions that are like clarifying questions, please don't hesitate to ask. But if you're like sort of cognizant about stuff and you're going to ask me a question like, hey, isn't that just like a monoid in the category of window functors or something like that, then you know, reserve those questions till the coffee break or the afternoon so that we can get through what we're trying to get through. Okay, so uh, before I start in on sort of definitions and lemmas and all that stuff, let me give you uh, a very high level overview of what we're trying to do here. So, from one perspective, you can think of category theory as 
uh, reimagining of set theory from a different perspective. Right? So instead of the primitive notions being those of set and membership in a set, instead we have the notion of set and function as primitive. But we don't stop there, we generalize again. So we don't assume that the objects of study in category theory are sets, but we just think that they're generic objects, and that will be a, a term of the art in the moment. And we don't assume that, that the maps between these objects are functions, that is, functional relations. We just assume that they're arbitrary mappings of some sort, right? And the only thing we assume that they have is something called a composition structure, which I'll elaborate on shortly. But to get the right at intuition, you can imagine if you're trying to build something out of Lego bricks, for example, right? The order in which you assemble the various bricks to one another that connect them doesn't, in the end, matter in what you build. It only matters sort of the bricks that you started with and which bricks were connected to which bricks, but not the, the temporal order in which you assembled them. And that's what I'll mean by a uh, composition structure, but I'll explain more shortly. <clears throat> OK, so as Bob kind of mentioned this morning, this setup gives us a lot of what's called axiomatic freedom, in that by assuming a lot less, we can apply our system to a lot more things. So by making fewer assumptions, we can describe more things. That's, that's the motto. Um, but, I mean, we're not stuck in an impoverished meta theory because we can always selectively reintroduce assumptions. For example, the um, law of the excluded middle or the axiom of choice or something like that, and we can recover the, the systems that we're familiar with from other settings. But the price we pay for this is that we have to reason in a way that I call behaviorally or externally, and that's in contrast to what I'll call structurally or internally. So in set theory, like, we know what elements of a set are, right? We know which elements are members of which set. But in category theory, we don't know what our objects of study are. We only know how they behave, how they relate to the other objects in the same category as them. Right? And so that's what I mean by studying behavior. So if you want a slogan, you can think of category theory as being like the sociology of formal systems, where instead of taking our objects of study and like dissecting them and like trying to see how they work by taking apart their brain or something, like we just watch what they do and then we try to infer, you know, what they must be thinking or doing or whatever based on their behavior. Okay, so that's sort of the, the 10,000 foot overview of category theory. Uh, how about categorical proof theory? So, as you learned a little bit um, from Frank this morning, right, proof theory is itself some kind of formal system. And it also has this kind of composition structure where if you have some sub-derivations of a proof that you're doing and you put them together eventually to, to make the full proof, right, it doesn't matter the order in which you put those derivations together, it just matters in the end how they're sort of connected to each other. Right? So, the plumbing matters, but what's connected to what, but not the order in which the pieces were plumbed together. Uh, okay, so the basic idea that we're going to apply eventually is that we're going to interpret logical propositions as objects in some kind of category, and we're going to interpret derivations or proofs. I use derivations to mean a proof which potentially has some like uh, some open assumptions. Uh, those will be the arrows between the objects. Okay. And the motivation, as I mentioned already, is we want to discover some kind of algebraic basis for connected plumbing. That's the marker of the in my hand. Okay. stuff, the 
first step it has is data. And the first piece of data it has is an object collection. <coughs> We'll call this C sub zero. And the sub zero you should think of as like the zero dimensional part of it. So the objects are like the points, and that's the zero dimensional bit. Right? And we write A colon C to mean that A is in the collection. Yes. 
There can be many errors. Okay. Let me continue, and then we'll get to examples and what can and can't happen. Okay. okay. Yes. This called Tom. What is this? This is the collection of arrows whose domain is A and whose domain is B. It's called the hob from A to B. And it's just a historical uh, term. You can imagine that it probably comes from homomorphism or something like that. Okay, let's continue. Uh, we've got the boundary functions, we've got this. Okay, then we have uh, identity functions, identity <coughs> arrow. And these are written kid, right? And they take objects to arrows. And they have the property that um, that kid of an object A is an arrow in the home set from A, oh, I use that word, A, the home collection from A to A. Right? So the domain of the identity arrow is that same object, and the codomain is also that same object. Okay. And then finally, we have arrow composition. And this is a partial function on arrows, right? So it's best to write it like this. Um, so if f is an arrow, oh, I should also say before I do this, a notational shorthand is if it's clear what which category we're talking about, then we will just drop this c, and we will instead write this as a arrow b. So without the c, without the name of the category. If it's clear from the context which category we're talking about, then we don't have to keep naming it again and again. So the reason I bring this up is that if F is an arrow from A to B, then G is an arrow from B to C, then we have F composed, note this dot, infix dot, uh, G, which is an arrow from A to C. So if we want to be careful about this, we take, right, these two arrows have, the, the composition is defined on them, just in case the codomain of the first is equal to the domain of the second, in which case they have a composite, and that composite has a domain that's the same as the domain of the first, and a codomain that's the same as the codomain of the second. This uh, normally you would have G dot F. Just wait, just wait, okay? I'll get there. Don't, don't give me notational flack yet. Is the ID home from A to A? Home from A to A? It's an element of the home from A to A. So it's in that collection. It's a distinguished arrow in that home collection. Yes? What's the difference between an arrow and a morphism? It's exactly the same thing. I, the technical word is morphism. I'll say arrow most of the time to be informal because it's also shorter to write, so I'll write it. Um, yes? The, the operation which maps an object with an entity or which maps these arrows to the composition, is that, can that be defined on a case by case basis or is it some kind of uniform? This is the data you must provide in order to have defined a category. And we're not done yet because there's still some more stuff you have to define. But so far, you have to have defined at least this much stuff. Yes? Um, the colon after ID of A, colon C, A, arrow A, is that the same colon in the last thing? Yeah, so I kind of snuck that in a little bit. I was hoping you wouldn't bring it up. But okay, we're going to see that this is some kind of collection. And we're going to ask what kind of collection this is going to be a member of that collection. But if you really, you can just. Think of it as well, okay. put the epsilon in if you want. Right? <clears throat> okay. Okay. I'm going to continue. Okay. So that's the data. 
But now there's also some logs. So there was data there, so now I've got logs. And so the first law is the left unit law of composition, I'll say of composition, but not related. And this says, um, or arrow, a, B, right, so I'm not naming the category, whatever the category is, it's C so far, right? Uh, the identity arrow on A followed by F is equal to F. Right, so this is just saying that the identity arrow is a left unit of composition so far, or three units of composition. Next we have the right, one of these. Three arrows, 